Okay, <clears throat> thank you for joining me. Um, we're back again, the second Sukkah. Um, final Perik, we're not very far away from completion. We have to start thinking about a real slam bang seal at the end of all this, expensive one, in a fine upper class hotel, hopefully. Um, we're on page 52B, Nun Beit Omad Beit. Um, and uh, we're about uh, just over half the way down, nearly two thirds of the way down. But before I pick you up as to where we are on the page, let me just um, get us up to date as to how we got where we are now. Um, the the Gemara originally uh, was was uh, in a Sukkah union of Simchas Beis Hashoeva, the um, the libation ceremony that was. Uh, a highlight of the base Hamikdash during the days of Sukkot, when the water used to be brought down from up from the uh, uh, city of David, up from the Shiluach pool to the Mizbeach. And there were great celebrations that lasted very many hours and all the way through the night uh, in the base Hamikdash. Singing, dancing, juggling, fireballs, um, a, a great spectacle. And uh, as part of the celebration, in order to avoid mixing, if you remember, um, the Mishnah told us that uh, a great structure was created in the um, courtyard of the Beis Hamikdash, which was really the first Chotzer Nashim, where the women would go up to the top. It would be a balcony from which they would be able to view the events of the celebrations down below. And uh, the reason for this was uh, because the uh, Yetzirah interferes and uh, there was going, if you allow mixing of men and women on a festive occasion, who knows what it will amount to. And to prevent that, there was this structure, which got the Gemara diverted on talking about the Yetzirah. So Yetzirah, which was the uh, motivation behind building this structure to separate men and women. And in talking about the Yetzirah, and its properties and the ways in which we can combat it. We spend some time describing the Sahara as a foe, as a, in terms of the sort of the psychological warfare that we need to be involved in, in uh, combating our Yitzhara. The Gemara also uh, informed us that the Acharis Hayomim, at the end of days, at the time of Mishir, HaKadosh Baruch Hu will uh, bring down the power of the Yitzhara. He will cut it down to size. It was Shach B'yed Sahara, B'achris Hayomim. And we used various psukim from Novi uh, to prove that point. We had to use a uh, drash on those psukim because those psukim were not talking about the Yed Sahara as such. They were talking about uh, leaders. They were talking about the war of Gog and Magog. But the Gemara um, drashically interpreted some of these psukim as referring to the battle um, to, to destroy the Yed Sahara and the eventual victory over the Yed Sahara. And um, in, this, uh, in this vein, we met lots of psukim, which were Acharis Hayomim Nevuot of Zechariah and of Micha and of Yeshayahu. And the Gemara then diverted yet again to talk about the more story aspects of these psukim, moving away from the drash of the Yed Sahara, who are they referring to? Who are the characters being referred to? So we, we're into a series of eschatological verses that deal with the uh, Mashiach site. Um, and that's how far we've moved away from the Simcha Beit Hashoeva. So I'm going to take you now to start the Gemara uh, from a place which, um, uh, quotes a posuk. The posuk is Vayar Eini Hashem Arba Acharoshim. And to be able to direct you to it, if you're looking at your Gemara sheets, if you start from where the y, the lines become wide and go across the page, then it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, something like ten lines down. The first word on the line is Papa. This is rough Papa. Pei Pei Aleph. And we're looking towards the end of um, that line, um, which is a quote of the verse from Zechariah, Vayar Eini Hashem Arba'a Haroshim. Vayar Eini Hashem Arba'a Haroshim. So if you've got that, that's where we started from. So this is another posuk which deals with the end of days, if you like. And um, it's a posuk from Zechariah. And this is the middle of a section that deals with a particular topic. Typically, the Gemara starts from the middle rather than starting from the beginning. 
Um, and it wants to make, a, it immediately wants to give you more information about uh, the period of Acharit HaYomim. We're talking about Acharit HaYomim um, because of the verses we've seen before. And this is yet another posseg. Coming from the book of Zacharia, it's particularly um, difficult to understand. Rashi says at the beginning of the book of Zacharia that it is sosum, that the, the book is closed. In other words, he doesn't understand it. And although he does give commentaries all the way through Zacharia, um, the symbolism of the Nevoas are very, very difficult to pierce. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Malbim is a big help. If you read Zuchar with the Malbim, you'll get the Malbim's view. But there are many views of what the various visions are. Um, and the visions are not even properly explained within the, the Nevoah itself. It's not as if we get a vision and then an interpretation. We get a vision and then perhaps a line from which you have to try and match up the vision with a line. Very, very difficult, the book of Zechariah. So let's just read a little bit of the Gomorrah and then I'll turn to share my screen with you because it is totally um, baffling when you just read the Gomorrah with the verses out of context. So let's go back to Gomorrah very briefly. Hashem Arba Haroshem. What does that mean? It means Hashem showed me, Zechariah saying, Hashem showed me four carpenters. Uh, that's the best translation uh, for carpenters. Suma Ninhu says the Gemara. Uh, who are these Arba Harashim? These these um, craftsmen, these carpenters. Who are they? These cra carpenters were shown to me, says Zechariah, in an end of days vision. What's the role of these carpenters? So Amar Rav Chana Bar Bizna, Amar Rabbi Shimon Chasida. Let's just see what the Gemara says and then try and work our way through the Pesukim to see what it really means. So Rav Chana Bar Bizna said in the name of Rav Shimon Chasida, Mashiach ben David, Mashiach ben Yosef, Eliyahu, Bechoen Sedek. Pack of people are very important individuals. Um, some of them which you would expect to appear in an end of days prophecy. And who are they? Mashiach ben David, the ultimate Mashiach that we wait for, Mashiach ben Yosef, who will meet an untimely end, unfortunately, just before the Mashiach ben David. He will pave the way, possibly militarily, um, possibly administratively, for the final Mashiach ben David. So again, we're dealing with a messianic vision there as well. Um, uh, the Eliyahu, we're prepared to see him also in a uh, um, uh, an end of days context because Eliyahu is the Novi who comes back and heralds the coming of the Mashiach. All very well, these three. And who's the fourth carpenter who, so to speak, is involved in the end of day vision? The fourth carpenter is the Kohen Sedek. Who's the Kohen Sedek? Kohen Sedek is Malki Sedek in Sefer Bracious, who comes out and brings gifts for Avraham after Avraham has vanquished the four kings. What has all this got to do with the end of days? So Mahdi Tzedek lives in Avraham's time. In what way is he heralding the coming of the Mashiach? So let's just keep those questions as open. As far as the Gemara is concerned, that almost explains everything, but it doesn't explain everything from our perspective. So I'm just going to mute everyone because I can still hear a little bit of, um, I haven't done my pre-muting. Everyone's very well behaved, so I haven't need to do so. Um, but let me share a screen with you. Okay, let me start from the beginning of that vision, because the quote here of four carpenters is part three, rather than even part two of the vision. What is this vision all about? So, says Zechariah, for a size ain't I, I lifted up my eyes, the Eire, and I saw the Hine Arba Kronos. So, behold, there were four Kronos. And in the translation, it's shown as four horns, which is actually a good translation because there's an alternative translation that would not have been good uh, because the word Karen or has actually got at least two connotations. A Karen can mean a corner. Um, we have, for example, the Mizbeach, Arba Karnos Hamizbeach, the four corners of the Mizbeach. It's a corner, Karen. And it can also mean a horn, the horn of an animal. And over here, the meaning is, I saw four horns. Let's go on. And I said to the Malach, 
who was speaking to me, in these visions, very often, there is a malach standing by, Zechariah, who helps to guide him in the interpretation of the visions which are being shown to Zechariah. So I said to the malach who was speaking to me, Ma'ele, what are these four horns that I see? And he said to me, the malach, Ela hakronos, these are the horns, asher zoru es Yehuda, which tossed Yehuda, the es Yisrael, and Yisrael, in other words, the people, the population of Yehuda, which is the southern kingdom at the time of the kings of Israel and Yisrael, the northern kingdom, Yerushalayim. They're the ones that tossed them, that caused them so much harm, so much pain, so much damage. These are the horns that you're seeing in this vision. Let's go a bit further. Fine. So far, so good, even though it may not mean anything. Then, here's our posuk. Vayareini Hashem arba harashim. And then Hashem showed me four carpenters. So let's go on in the vision. Vaomar, and I said, says Zechariah, ma'ela ba'am lasos. What are these carpenters about to do? The carpenters have got their chisels and their planes and their saws and their drills in their hands. And so Zachary says, what are these carpenters? What is their mission? What shiputzim are they about to carry out? Vayomer Lemar. And the Malach answered me, saying this, Eile hakronos ashazeris Yehuda. These, these horns which um, struck and gored and tossed Yehuda, kifi ish lo nosaro show, such that nobody was able even to raise their heads against these horns. By your vow, Eila, these, which these, these carpenters are coming, lahacharidosom, to frighten them off, oliyados as karnos agoyim, anos im kerem el eretz Yehuda lezerosa, and to throw off the horns of those nations that raising up their horns against Judah in order to toss it out. In other words, very simply speaking, if you're looking at this um, prophecy, um, the angel is ask, answering that these carpenters have come to chop off those horns. Those horns were those horns that they used to gore the Jewish people for generation after generation. The carpenters are coming. This is the end of days. They're going to do their work. And they're going to shave off the horns of those nations, so to speak, so that they can do no more damage to the Jewish people. So it's a messianic vision. And the horns are the armed forces, the armies that have come uh, to battle and to displace and to send the Jewish people into exile. Those nations' horns, their military capability is going to be shaved off them. It's a remarkable vision again. Um, and it's this vision of Zechariah. I think that's the end of this particular piece. Just, just out of interest, um, the Malbim goes into quite a lot of detail on this as well. Even Rashi says that the four horns represent four nations that have given Soros to Klal Yisrael. They may be the Babylonians and the Assyrians. They may be the Greeks and the Romans. If you can take four, we've had more than four in the past. But if you want to look at great nations, and at the end of days, those great nations whose horns have been used to cause destruction to the Jewish people, um, they will be decapitated, so to speak, and won't be able to cause any damage again. Um, and Rashi says it's the four, it's the four nations. But Malbam adds the point that since the, the word Karen can mean not just horn, but corner, it refers essentially to the Jewish people throughout history. The Jewish people throughout history have been burdened by the fact they've been scattered to the four corners of the earth, Arab Kronos. And each, each of the nations they're in have, so to speak, gored at their Jewish uh, inhabitants and residents and caused them, uh, caused them trouble and suffering. So you can see these, not just as the four specific nations through biblical history, but essentially as very much like in the Haggadah, the he sha'amda the same of Alonu, every generation, lo echa bulvad omad aleinu lachalasein, ele shebechol dov adar omdim aleinu lachalasein. This is the story of the Jewish people throughout history. Eventually, our Kaddish Baruch Hu will, will shave off those horns. These, these carpenters come 
to share a shave off the wall. It's a very picturesque uh, view of it. Uh, in in um, the Zos Habrocha, you have a posuk that uses words a little bit more, a little bit similarly. I put it very small over here. But this is to do with Yosef. It's a bracha of Yosef. Bechor um, Shera, one second. Hadar lo karne reim karnov. The horns of the stag are his horns. And it says, Bohem amim He will use those horns to gore the nations. This is when the Jews are have the upper hand. They will use their horns. The Jewish horns will be goring the nations. The Joseph's horns will be goring the nations. This is the opposite uh, story over here. These chronos have been used, these horns have been used by the non-Jewish nations to batter us, and they will be shaven off at the end of days. So that's the that's the prophecy. Um, we look at it wholesale within the within the Chumash. I just stop sharing here for a moment. <clears throat> Al Gemara over here has looked at it a little bit differently because the way I've explained it so far, um, the carpenters are, if you like, God's agents here to chop off the horns of those nations that have caused us so much sorrow. Uh, but the Gemara said, "Who are these Arba Harashim?" I and mean, it's given us actual names. It said they are. They, they are Mashiach ben David, Mashiach ben Yosef, ben Yohan. Now, those three actually make a bit of sense because at the end of days, they will herald a new age when those powers that have always worked uh, to destroy the Jewish people um, will, will be defenseless themselves. Uh, HaKadosh Baruch Hu will shave off their horns. Mashiach ben Yosef will set the sage, stage for it. Mashiach ben David and Eliyahu, so to speak, brings the signal. He heralds the coming of the Mashiach. So in some ways we can see that as relating to the carpenters, three of the four carpenters, if you like. The fourth carpenter here is Cohen Sedek, who is Malchi Sedek from Sefer Beratius. He's completely out of uh, context here. What is he doing over here? He's certainly not within the generation of the coming of the Mashiach. Is he going to reappear again, this Cohen Sedek? So here you just have the commentaries grappling for a reason why Cohen said it is in this list. You can either say, well, I don't understand it. Hazal had a reason for adding him to this list as someone who's involved, so to speak, in toppling the four nations. Or you have to find um, some sort of midrashic reasoning. And one of the reasons given, interestingly, is that uh, Mahi Tzedek comes out after um, Abraham has won the war uh, of the four nations against the four nations. And in a sense, we're saying that that may have been a very early remez, even in Abraham's time, to the um, downing of the four nations in Messianic times. That was, if you like, um, uh, Masa Avo, Simon Labonim, something that happened uh, thousands of years before Mashiach, where already there was a war against four nations. And, uh, and Abraham intervened and was able uh, to defeat them. And at the end of days, um, there will be four carpenters who will come, so to speak, and they will defeat the nations or prevent them from gaining any more power and authority over them. And Cohen Sedig represents the, if you like, eternal um, symbol of a battle against the nations. Abraham was actually the one who did the battle, but Cohen Sedig then offers him, um, offers him uh, a, a, a gift as a result uh, of uh, for his uh, for his uh, uh, victory over those nations. It could be that's the reason he's included over here. Anyway, let's go on with the Gemara. The Gemara, first of all, in, in understanding our story, just raises a technical point, which is um, difficult to understand because it's essentially just a misunderstanding of the POSIC that I just explained to you. So we won't spend too much time on the misunderstanding because we have understood it correctly. But let's see what the misunderstanding is. Masir Rav Sheshis. Rav Sheshis asks the following kasha. In that story, which we just explained, that vision of um, uh, Zechariah with the horns and with the carpenters, Ihochi, if this is the way we're trying to understand it, that which was written in the Posuk by Yoma, um, these are the horns that uh, have tossed Yehuda, etc. These four that you've just mentioned, these great notables, Mishir, Mendov, and Yosef, they can't be the horns. They've come in order to restore the Jewish pride. Well, of course they're not the horns. We're talking about them being the carpenters and not the horns. 
And that's why the Gemara tries to explain that you misunderstood the posset. The posset is a bit misleading. It goes backwards and forwards between the horns and the carpenters. So Amale, so Rav um, Chama answered, he said, Shvil is safe here to cry. Why don't you read the end of the verse? As if to say, Rav Sheshis, don't try and take a verse out of context. Read what it's saying. That's what I try to do with you. I try to read all the verses um, of the Navi. So we see how they all fit in. So he says, Shafil the safe de Croix, go down to the end of the verse, and it says there, by Eile, these four carpenters, what is their mission? Lahacharidosom, to terrify the uh, four uh, uh, the four horned creatures, if you like, which are the four nations, Liyadosis Karnos Hagoyim, to, to throw off the uh, the horns of the nations of the world, who have raised their horn against Yehuda uh, in an attempt to uh, scatter Yehuda and the Jewish people to the four corners of the world. Um, and those four nations, those four men people mentioned over here, are not the four horns. They are, of course, the four carpenters, as we've understood it. And, and rather cutely, the Gemara ends this particular piece of Agadata um, with a congratulatory statement uh, from Rav uh, Sheshis to Rav Chana, who's explained this Pasuk. So Amale, so Rav Sheshis said to Rav Chana, Bahadi Chana Agadata Lamali, what am I doing trying to stand up to Rav Chana when it comes to Agada? Rav Sheshis was one of the greatest Amoron in Talmud Bavli. Rav Chana is le less well known. And Rav Sheshis is saying, you know, even though I may be the leading sage when it comes to halacha, I've got a lot of work to do to catch up with Rav Chana when it comes to understanding agada, when it comes to understanding the inner meaning of Tanakh, et cetera, et cetera. You can see really that whenever you look through the Gemara, you often find when you go between agadata and um, halacha areas, you find there is some. Amaroyim, who specialized, indeed even some Tanah, who specialized in Agadah, Medrash, trying to expound verses in a way that gives additional layers of meaning to the simple meaning. And you find others who specialize in deriving halacha from Sukkim, you know, and Pilpul, and Kalvachomer, and Gzeir Shavra, and all this sort of stuff, the halachic derivations. And of course, everyone had to be able to do both. This is all part of Torah. However, there were some who specialized in one field and others in another. And Rav Sheshis is saying to Rav, saying essentially, Rav Chana, he's got it over me when it comes to Agada, and I accept his uh, explanation of this posse. So anyway, we have an end of days prophecy over here about the horns being cut off by the carpenters uh, who will bring an end to the power of the Umoto Olam. The Gemara now is now going to read another posuk, which is also a difficult posuk, I'm afraid to say. Um, and this is from Micha. Um, and the Gemara is going to quote this posuk. Let me just see. I'm not sure. Did I actually? Let me share for a moment with you. Share screen. I don't remember whether I actually copied it down. Yes, I did. I find this verse even more difficult. The translation is absolutely useless, by the way. If you want to look at the translation, it might as well be done by Google Translate in the amount of, uh, in terms of the way it flows and the sense it makes over here. This is taken from Safari. I don't do my own translation as well. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe it works according to some, some, some uh, interpreters, certainly not to me. Let's read the posuk. The posuk says in Micha, and again, it's talking about the end of days. At the end of days, when the great powers, so to speak, will be brought down to size and they won't be troubling the Jewish people anymore. Um, the great empires that used to, uh, that exiled the Jewish people, uh, that attacked Jewish line, et cetera. And Ashur is one of them. Ashur, the Assyrians, they were the really the very first major problem to Klan Yisrael. They took away the Northern Kingdom way before the destruction of the temple by the Babylonians. The Babylonians, so to speak, took over the mantle of the Assyrians. And Ashur, we find actually in a few places in Ashur, it's a sort of byword as, a, as an enemy, a, a bit like Amalek is as a general demon. Ashur is, in terms of biblical times, uh, second, first temple times, because it starts the whole process of trying to dismantle 
uh, the state of Israel. They took 10 tribes into exile, not a small loss for the general, for the Jewish people. So when we try to think of an enemy, you know, uh, we, we think of Ashur. If we, we certainly we're living um, uh, in in uh, in second in first temple times. <clears throat> so Vahoyo Zeshalom. What does this mean? And this is very very difficult to understand. Um, and I'll try and explain it away. I think I've seen it in terms of the uh, Chazal and the Malbim. Vahoyo Zeshalom. This shall be peace. What does it mean, this shall be peace? Eventually, at the end of days, I think this is the way the Malbim learns it, which is very original, there will be real peace. And what does real peace mean? Real peace will mean that you won't need to go to war anymore. It's not that you'll be more powerful. We're not saying the Jewish people will have nuclear weapons and laser technology, etc., and their, um, their um, uh, military prowess and technology will be so advanced that other nations won't want to attack us. I mean, obviously, that's what we work for even today. But that's not the meaning of shalom. Shalom means that nations just don't have no interest in you anymore in terms of making war. They're doing their own thing. They want to establish peaceful relationships, right? The Abraham Accords. That's what shalom is. Shalom isn't being able to prevent your enemy from attacking you, but rather to dispose of having enemies in the first place. So shalom. this will be what we call peace, right? That's the way you have to understand this. It's not at all clear. Ashur, and now the Malvin learns this almost as a different rhythm from here onwards. Ashur ki senu. Remember when Ashur used to come to our land, senu, and it would trample over our palaces. Now you can't say that's peace. So what it means to say is when you have real peace, then when you remember back what used to happen, when when we when Ashur, they would come against us and they would trample our palaces, they would pillage the land of Israel. That is not gonna happen anymore because what will happen in the future is that there will be shalom and there will be no need to fight back. The hakemono olov, and we will set up over the, the, the people, if you like, the Jewish people, shiva roim, Seven shepherds, Ushmona Nasiche Odom, and eight princes of man. And when that shalom comes, instead of needing to fight Ashur, we will have, so to speak, the Sheva Roim and the Shimona Nasiche Odom, who will who will be our leaders in some way in the background, and there will be no more need for war. There will just be no more need for war. There will be shalom instead of uh, military defense. It's very difficult to know what it means. The Gomorrah here, as we'll see, isn't interested in what the possible means at all. The Gomorrah is only trying to give us an interpretation here because this is another end of days prophecy. Is who are these seven Roem shepherds and who are the Shmona Nesiche Adam? And when we read the Gomorrah, it's also not very easy. So let me just stop sharing for the moment because um, that just about... Um, is the only part of the posset which is of any interest to us. Who are these characters who will stand for us um, and defend our interests, not militarily, but somehow spiritually? So the Gomorrah quotes this posset, when Ashur comes against us, and, and it used to trample over our palaces, However, from now on, at the time of the Achris Ayomim, Akemono Allah Shiva Romishman and Sikhodam, there will be seven shepherds and eight princes of men. Nasikh is a prince. So Maninhu, Shiva Roim, who are these seven shepherds? And the Gemara, Gemara gives us the list, gives us their identity. They are David Baemtsa, David in the middle, middle. There's seven standing there, right? The fourth one, or whichever side you go from, is in the middle. Who stands in the middle with three on either side, three on the right and three on the left? In the middle is David. Okay. And who's on the right? Adam. Adam Harishan. Shays, a son of Adam. Umesu Shelach, Methuselah. Where does he come from? What's he doing on this list? Miyamono. These three will be on the right of David HaMelech. And who's on the left? The Abraham, the Yaakov, 
Abraham and Jacob, or Moshe Bismolo. So Abraham, Yaakov, and Moshe are on the left. So you've got three on the right of David, three on the left of David, but not all of these characters are necessary people you expect to be the leading um, spiritual beings of our Jewish history who stand, so to speak, at the end of days, whatever that means that they stand at the end. We don't really know. Does this mean they're trias amazing? Does it mean their spirits will come to revive us? We just don't understand this particular Navua. Uh, but why these particular individuals as well? Anyway, look at the second lift, Abraham Yaakov. Where did Yitzchak go? Don't anyone remember? Why not say Abraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov? Why is it Abraham, Yaakov, and Moshe? Big question mark on that. Let's go to the first three on the right and understand those. Adam, <clears throat> why Adam? Adam lives in a different dimension. He's a Gan Eden individual. What has he got to do with the end of days? Difficult to say. Chase, what's so special about Chase? Chase is all supposed to be uh, a tzaddik as an individual. Mesushelach. Mesushelach we almost know nothing about except a Gadiklia. Remember Agadikli, what we know about Mesu Shelach is that according to legend, I think Rashi brings it, that Hashem didn't bring the marble on the Jewish people until after Mesu Shelach had died and, his, and the Yemei Avelis for Mesu Shelach was over. In other words, Mesu Shelach mythically was a tzaddik, such a tzaddik that Akarish Baruch Hu did not wish him to experience the suffering of the marble and of the rebuilding of the world after the marble. So he took him away before, after the shiva was over, then the marble came down, which suggests midrashically that Mr. Shelach was a great tzaddik, but we know nothing about him. And somehow these three are put on the right and Aram Yaakov and Moshe on the left. There's a bit of a symmetry over here because um, Adam, Shays and Mr. Shelach of the all three lived before the great marble. So they're very early on, if you like, in our prehistory. They're pre of us even. And they're sitting, they're standing to the right of, of David. David is this great character, of course, who represents the coming of the Mashiach. So we, we sort of understand what he's doing in the middle. His role, his, his role is clear. And then on his left, we would under, we would like to see the others, maybe, Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, but instead we got Avram, Yaakov, and Moshe. Now, I'm not unhappy with Moshe, but I am surprised that Yitzhak is missing. I'm not the only one who's noticed this. All Chazal, all the Mepharshim go, go, to, go to crack their heads as to why Yitzhak is not in this list. It's one of the few lists where you would have um, Abraham and Yaakov without Yitzchak in the middle, and we need to know why. And we don't know why. This is a Gemara. There is a Medrash that tries to explain that he was gone somewhere. He had another role to play, and therefore he wasn't allowed to take the role of being one of these seven, um, uh, one of these seven shepherds. Why are they called shepherds, by the way? David was a rower. Moshe was a rower. He was a shepherd. You could say Abraham and Yaakov were shepherds as well. Adam wasn't actually a shepherd, as far as we know. And Shays and Mr. Shelach, we don't know. So here we're using the word rower in a different sense, not necessarily a shepherd of flocks. These are shepherds of the Jewish people. And somehow they had an influence in um, leading the Jewish people in a certain direction, just like a shepherd leads his flocks. That's the way you might understand this so far. That's just part one. These are the Shiva Roim. And then the Gemara had, the Posik said in uh, Micha, Shimon and Sichayodon. So the Gemara naturally asks, who are these eight princes? Sounds a little bit like a nursery rhyme or a, a children's story, the eight princes here. Um, Shimon and Sichayodon, who are they? Man Hinhu. So here the Gemara brings another list, not of all of which is really understandable either. So let's start. Yishai, the father of David. The Gemara says Yishai was one of the great Sadiqim who almost never sinned. Yishai was one of the greatest Sadiqim in Jewish history. Again, we don't know this except midrashically, because we know very little about Yishai from the Posset itself. We introduced him as being the father of David, but not much more than that. And he had other sons. But what else do we know about Yishai? This is a midrashic idea that he was a great Sadiq. Shaul, why Shaul? Shaul was, a, he's not even from Malchus David. He's a, he was flawed in that uh, he was actually displaced as king um, by Shmuel because he didn't carry out the Milchemes Amolek properly. So, okay, Shaul was a melech and he was a great melech, but at the end, he didn't meet the, um, 
the objectives that were set for him as the first Melech of Israel, and yet he is one of these Nesichim, one of these princes. Shmuel, Shmuel is a great Navi, so I quite understand what he's doing over here, that he's a prince, he was the leader, he's a Navi Rishon, if you like, of Klal Yisrael. And now we have um, Amos, another Navi. Why do we pick the ones we have? If you look at this list mix, Yishayahu is missing, Micha is missing. We have Amos. Amos was a contemporary of Yishayahu and Hoshea. Why did we pick Ho uh, Amos out of this list? Don't really know. Utsvanya. But Tsvanya is a very much a minor Navi who lived later on. Why Tsvanya? We don't know. Um, Sitkiyah was a great, was one of the last kings of Israel before the uh, exile into Bovel, taken into captivity by the Babylonians, Sidkiyahu, and he was a tzaddik. There is another girsa on this, uh, Bryce, another variant reading that substitutes for Sidkiyah, Chizkiyahu, Hezekiah, who was one of the really great kings in Jewish history, an earlier, much earlier king than Sidkiyahu. Okay, Umashiach, and the Mashiach comes in over here almost as an afterthought into this list of the seven of the eight princes, the Eliyahu. Okay, Mashiach and Eliyahu, they should be on the list. We're talking about the end of days. We're talking about um, a new reality and a new world at the end of days. So certainly we expect Mashiach and Eliyahu. <clears throat> but why do we have some of these characters in this list? Well, you'd be pleased to know that Rashi has a comment um, over here. Um, I'm trying to find it now. Yes. And he, ha he has a comment, comment where he says, Lo your dati bohem tam. He says, I don't know the reason for why some of these characters are here and why some characters that should be here aren't here. So Rashi is very modest. He says, I don't know. And there's a few places where Rashi says, I don't know. This is Rashi. He will always say this if he doesn't know. Otherwise, um, he will come up with a convincing explanation. He doesn't, he often comes up with explanations. Here he doesn't even wish to come up with an explanation because he doesn't feel whatever explanation he'll give will be adequate to explain those who are not on the list who should be and those who are on the list and we don't know why they're there. So here we are, another rather strange Gemara uh, talking again um, about end of days and the, so to speak, the great characters in Jewish history will play a role in the final, in the final um, uh, establishment of the new world, uh, a new messianic world. Now, can you believe it? We've actually reached the end of this particular piece of lengthy Agadita. We finished the Yetzirah. We're going right back to the simple space Hashoeva, which is something I think the last time we probably talked about it was, you know, four to six weeks ago. That was the topic of our parent, but we've meandered so far away um, and we're now coming back. So we're on Arba Sulamos. Arba Sulamos, um, uh, which is, uh, Arba is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10, almost to take you right back to where you are at the page. Um, a known base on base, 10 lines from the bottom, the last word, Arba A. Arba Sulamos. So let me just share with you a screen, because this is a quote from the Mishnah, and it's a Mishnah we learned so long ago that we've obviously, like me, forgotten what the Mishnah said. So I'm going to share the screen. Come on, work. Okay. All right. All right. This is part of what the Mishnah said. The Mishnah had said, as a description of the simplest base Hashoeva ceremony. It said, I'm uh, on the top paragraph here. Uh, on the Motsa uh, Yomta first day of Sukkos, Yordu le Ezras Noshim, they would go down to what was known as the Ezras Noshim, this big courtyard um, at, the, at the back of the base Hamikdosh. Um, large numbers of people, the Kohanim, and also others, Umetaknim Sham Tikkun Godon. This is where they built this great big tikkun, which is the um, the balcony for the women. They built this great structure so the women could be upstairs and watch the events below. Umenora Shal Zahav Hayusham. If you remember, I showed you a picture going right back. Um, there were great big um, menorahs, Shal Zahav, golden menorahs. Well, it doesn't mean the golden candelabrum you place on your table, but enormously tall 
um, uh, flaming poles, if you like, to give light to the whole area. The Arboyolo, the Arbos, oh, sorry, I'm, I'm, there's so many Arbos here. The Arbos Fonim Shulzahov, and there were four buckets of gold, Veroshehen, uh, at the top of these um, four, uh, of these four, uh, on the menorahs. There were four, on each menorah, there were four buckets. And in these, on these buckets, there was the oil, and the oil would burn. So there were like large containers of oil on the top of these poles. Those were all, that was what, what we called the menorah. And there were four ladders for each of these um, menorahs. The Arba Yolodim, the Pirche Kuhuna, and four children are from the Pirche Kuhuna, ch child Kohanim, this is child labor, child Kohanim, they would uh, climb up these ladders. Ubi Yedehim Kadim Shal Shemen, they would have flasks of oil, Shal Meav Esrim Log, 120 log in terms of volume that they carried up. Shaheim Martilin Ochal Sefel the Sefel which they would then dispense or pour into each of those buckets. I mean, I'll just take you back to the, I'm not sure, maybe the picture isn't over here. Let me just see if the picture's over here again. Sorry, not to make you dizzy. Control home, does that work? Right, did I do it over here or did I do it somewhere else? You remember this wonderful picture, which I bring time and time again. It's, uh, it's Rembrandt, I believe. Actually, it isn't. It's a temple institute. And here you see one, two, three, four. You see large poles. And you actually see, if I expanded, you see the ladders. Well, you see maybe a ladder over here. So there were four ladders on each. And there are four um, large containers over here. that's like beautiful lampposts. And the Kalhani would clamber up carrying these flasks, which would contain the oil, and they would... Uh, for the contents of the oil to keep these uh, huge candelabra burning. Okay, just take us back to the end. <clears throat> okay, I'll stop sharing over here. All right, so that was the story the Mishnah brought for us. So the Gemara asked the question, the, the Mishnah has just said that the flasks that they took up were Kadi Shemen shall may of Esrin Lug, 120 log, 120 log. We'll get into an idea of how big a log is in a moment. It doesn't mean like a log from a log cabin. It's Lamed Vav Gimel. That's, that's a volume measure for liquid. So the Gomorrah is asked the question, e the, uh, in the yeshiva, they asked the following question. They speculated on the following. Do we mean may of Esrin Lug? Kulho, that the four Kohanim children who went up, they carried a total volume of 120 uh, log between them, yes, um, which means 30 log for each um, boy, Kohen. Or do we mean that each of them carried 100? and 20 log on the way up. You would have thought it's a terrible important problem, but the Gemara does consider this to be a detail that needs sorting out. Did they each have to carry up a load of 120 log, or was it 30 log each times four equals 120? So the Gemara now brings a proof from a Brysa, which of these two possibilities uh, the Mishnah remains. Toshima, come and hear from a Brysa, which deals with the same topic. It says in this Brysa, which is contemporary to the Mishnah, but is a different source, will be Dehem, in the hands of the Kohanim, it says, of these Kohanic children, Hade Shemen Shel Shloshim Shloshim Log, where are pitchers or flasks, each of which were 30 Log, Shehem Kulam Me Log, which means that for each, so to speak, lamppost, there was a total of 120 Log. Each Kohen only carried up. 30 log. So this Brysa answers the question. Well, how big is 30 log in terms of the sense of imagination? So in terms of liquid volume, the easiest way I understand is to say that a log is um, about six eggs in volume, six baits in. 
Yeah, and it's a bit difficult when you're talking about eggs because eggs don't sort of hold together properly. But if you want to put your six eggs into a full um, uh, pitcher of water and look at the volume of water that overflows, that is the volume taken up by six eggs. Um, that's one log. And 30 log is 30 times that, the volume of 180 eggs, which is actually a large volume of oil to carry up, which is heavy. And if these are children and they're carrying these um, heavy pitchers up a ladder and then they're pouring them in to, uh, uh, into a sort of fuel on the top of those poles in which the Gomorrah, they actually Mishnah went on to say there was um, uh, worn clothing as wicks and they would then light the wicks. A very dangerous activity. Nowadays, it would not be allowed for children to do these sorts of things. Although having said that, when it comes to sort of burning the chomets in the streets of Yerushalayim, I've seen children do all sorts of hazardous things completely unsupervised by their parents. So maybe this is not really so far from what we even see today. This is what we, they would do. Now, the Gemara is impressed by the fact that these children had such koyach that they were able to clamber up it doesn't say how old they are, by the way. Maybe they were 10 or 11. We are not talking about uh, 14 or 15 years. We're talking about real Pirche Puna, really quite young. So they used to they used to dash up over here with these heavy pitchers. So the Gomorrah now brings a, a brysa to show how powerful these young kids must have been. It says in the brysa, Tonna. It was taught in the brysa. Verhein, this is this is one of these guzmart, I think. It's a bit of an exaggeration. They were even more, their strength, these Pirche Kuhuna, was even more impressive, if you like. Yosef Mibbenosh and Marta Basbaisis, even more so than the son of Marta Basbaisis. Let's, before we talk about her, let's just see what the story was about the son of Marta Basbaisis. Omru al Benosh and Marta, they said about Marta's son, um, um, Shalmarta, Shalmarta Basbaisus, he was a Kohen. I think he was married. She married, apparently, Yeshua ben Gamla, according to the Gemara. This is very early on in, in it's, it's, it's it, well, I mean, it's, it's early on in Tanaitic times, anyway. Shahoya, what did he used to do? He was a young Kohen, and he was still sort of trying to uh, earn his stripes, or whatever the word is, as a Kohen. Shahoyo Notel, when he was doing his practice runs, if you like, he used to be able to carry two thighs, if you like, heavy thighs of a great ox on his hands, which were worth a thousand zos in money, a huge amount. We're talking about very heavy animals that had been given to the base Hamidosh. Um, and um, they were being used for carbonus. And he, what did he used to do with them? He used to place two at a time, perhaps one on each shoulder. And then, says the Brysa, Umahalech Akev Betzad Godel. This is cute. He used to walk along um, the ramp of the Mizbeh upwards to the, to the gag of the Mizbeh to place these two thighs on the flat roof of the Mizbeh. He used to work up the slope of the Mesper, Akov Betzad Godel, you know what that means? Heel against toe, heel against toe. Um, th that's what he used to do. Now, what's so special? Uh, Rashi explains that if you're trying to carry heavy load and it's just about something you can bear carrying, you rush along, you know, and then you almost throw it off your shoulders and huff and puff at the end. He didn't need to do that at all. He would passively walk along as if the load wasn't disturbing him at all. And he didn't even need to take big strides. And essentially, he could balance by putting his, 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 his left toe to touch his right heel and bring his, his where am I now, uh, to touch his right heel and then bring his, his, right, uh, his right heel over to touch his forward left toe, etc. You know, the way in which you might walk along, a tightrope walker might walk along heel to, heel to toe. He was able to do that while walking up the ramp of the Mizbeach slowly and steadily. That's what he was able to do. But now that the Gemma actually goes on, the Bryce has said they wouldn't let him do it. 
But the lo he ni chuhu echov ha kohanim says Cain. His brethren amongst the kohanim did not permit him to do this, to carry up two heavy uh, thighs single-handedly, just because he was capable of doing so. Why? Mishom, because of this famous posuk we always quote, Barov Am Havras Melech. It is much more of a cover to Akorish Borchu that people serve him in large numbers than do so as individuals. In other words, if you can cho choose to find a shul with a big oil on, a big zipper, it's more of a cover to Akorish Borchu to daven with a lot of people than to go to a very small shul where you're exactly 10 people. That's a general idea. Whenever you do a mitzvah, the more people who are who are present, the greater the covert. In the same way, you know, if you go, if, if you're setting up a royal event, you know, you want to bring the great crowds in, you know, so that the king is honored. So Akarish Baruch is honored by large numbers of people. Therefore, if you've got a choice, either to allow this um, son of Martabat Bysus to show his biceps by carrying on solo run with his two um, thighs of, uh, of, of ox meat, or to have 20 Kohanim doing the same. That's Barov Amhadras Mela. So the Kohanim authorities did not allow him to show off his strength because that was a travesty Barov Amhadras Mela. But the, the, the reason the Gemara brings this price, sir, is it just said at the beginning that these Pirche Kohuna, in some senses, um, they were capable of feet of a feat even greater than the sound of Martabas Bysus. Doesn't sound like it to me at the moment, just carrying up oil. Why is that so much more of a feat than this, this, this muscle man who can move two oxen on his, on his shoulder? So the Gemara asked that question itself now. The Gemara says, my Meshubochim, in what way do we learn from this story, this story that um, the Pirche uh, Kohanim were even more impressive? There's nothing that it seems the more most impressive thing you can do is what the son of Marta Basbisis did. So the Gomorra says, if you're saying that the oil they carried up the ladders to the top of the poles was so heavy, there's no doubt that ox meat, the thighs, large thighs of ox meat, must be heavier than the um, liquid load that the um, Pirche Kahuna carried up with them. Ella says the Gemara, the aspect of the Pirche Kahuna that is so impressive, more impressive, really, even than that of um, the son of Martabas Bysus, is Hossam Kevesh, Kevesh Umaruba the Lozakif. When Martabas Bysus, yes, he carried a very heavy load, but he didn't have to carry it vertically upward. He carried it up a slope. It was a one in four slope, by the way, I think, according, which is quite a slope. You know, I'm not sure whether Karen Kayemis is anywhere near, uh, Rachel Karen Kayemis coming up from the Wilson is anywhere near one in four, but it's, um, it, it's quite a steep slope, but it's not the same as going almost vertically up a ladder. So the Pirate Corner had to vertically carry maybe a lesser load, but all the way up a ladder. And they weren't allowed to spill any oil, I imagine. That wouldn't have been a good deal. Uh, whereas uh, the son of Martabas Bysus didn't have such a didn't have such a difficult task in moving up a gradual slope. So to that extent, the Gemara wants to say that um, the Pirche Kuna were doing something even more impressive. But just a little bit of a biography. Remember, Marta Bas Bysus is a famous lady. She actually appears most famously in Sechus Gittin, in the uh, whole editor there of Thomas Kamsa and the dis dis destruction of the face base of Mikdosh, the events that led up to it, the Sinat Chinom, etc. Um, but in the story there, it talks about the siege of the Romans on your, in your Yerushalayim on the, in terms of the Bayez Shani, destruction of Bayez Shani. And it says that um, uh, starvation took hold in, the, uh, in Yerushalayim. It was out of, under siege. No food could come in. If you remember, the Birionim, the, the rebels, the, the extremists that actually set fire to the granaries, in Yerushalayim, they could have fed the Jerusalemites for years, but they did so in order to make it inevitable and unavoidable that the Jews would break out and fight the Romans hand to hand. And that's what they wanted to see. They didn't want to see the, their brethren remain under siege. They wanted to see their people take 
a counterattack measure because, and they had no choice because there was no food, they would rush out and attack. That was the idea of the Birionim, a terrible thought, but that was the Birionim. So there was no food. The, the city was under siege. And the Gemara brings the story of Martabas Baisus, who, who was one of the um, Ashire Yushalem, one of the richest and most aristocratic women in Jerusalem. And she married a great noble um, rabbi, and her son was, and he was a Kohen, and the son was this, 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 this muscular Kohen. He was obviously very well fed, and he probably did a lot of exercises in his youth. But this Martabas Baisus, at the end of days, it brings a terrible story to show how are the mighty fallen. This was a woman who was so sensitive, what should I say, so adina, so refined, so spoilt, that she would never do any of her own shopping. And she always used to do the shopping via her servant, her butler. He always used to go out to the marketplace. She wouldn't even have known what to do. She had no money. She didn't know what to ask for. She asked him to go out. She says, look, we've run out of our, in our magnificent larder, of all white, soft bread. Will you, uh, will you go out and get me some more um, beautiful, fluffy white bread? And that's the instruction he got. So he goes out into the marketplace and uh, when he gets to the marketplace, they've run out of the fluffy white bread and they only have stuff now, which is a little bit coarser, but he's not being told to buy coarse bread. So he goes back home and he says, dear Miss Marta, he says, I'm afraid there isn't any more fluffy white bread. So there was nothing for me to buy. So she says, well, in that case, go back and buy the more granular stuff. So he goes back into the marketplace. And by that time, would you guess it? All the granular stuff has also run out. So there was none of that. And um, so he goes back and uh, she says, well, get whatever you can. So he goes back to the marketplace and everything is gone. See what happens if you don't have the first opportunity? Yes, she gave him the wrong instruction. And the instruction was always just to buy what she asked for and never to buy a substitute. He comes back, there's no substitute and she's starving. She realizes there's no point sending her servant anymore. She goes out into the streets of Yerushalayim where people are dying uh, on the street in terms of starvation uh, and the scenes are terrible. And the Gemara says there that as she walks through the streets in her finest shoes, uh, and um, and she's still, you know, well laundered, if you like. She's still one of the last people who has soap and water and everything. She puts her foot on some cow dung or something like it, or horse dung, manure, which she's never encountered in her life. And she's so disgusted by it that her her heart breaks and she dies on the streets. That's the story of Marta Basbisa. So I've left you with a rather nice ending. Uh, rather, rather, rather sober ending to the story. This is the wealthy martyr by Spices who met such a terrible end. But the Gemara only brings the story over here to say she had a well-fed son, very muscular, and that on the way to tell you how strong and courageous were the Pirche Kohanim. So we'll we'll stop at this point, and uh, please God, we'll have some ha happier things to say next week. Um, and please God, maybe the uh, Mashiach will come by then. We'll have will be in the Achris Hayomim. Thank you for joining me. Thank you, Ellie. Shkoyach. Okay. Oh, I have to remember to stop recording.